Welcome everyone, this is our Wednesday Wisdom where we go over tips, tricks, and information on band instrument repair. Today we're going to show you how to install an open hole flute pad. Yes. Uh, make sure we do have a hashtag for today, that is Padtober, just like last week. Make sure you put that in the comments below, that's going to give you a chance to win 15% off any of the courses that we have coming up. Uh, this month we also have the, oh how do I do this? Oh, there oh it is. That's, a, that's a cool <laughs> trick, I want to do that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> uh, so October 16th through 18th, that's coming up, that's Ryan's engraving class, he's prepping for that this week. Yes. And we are going to be uh, also having that as well as our Smackdown for the prize for this week as well as next week. So if you take hashtag Padtober, put that in the comments below, you can win 15% off the engraving course. You can also win 15% off the tuition uh, for the, not tuition, for the entrance fee for yes. the SAC Smackdown on October, not October, February, February 23 and 24. Sorry about that. Uh, so make sure you take hashtag Padtober, put that in the comments below and we'll get you your prizes. We do have a winner for today. And the winner is username Leo5208. Right. Leo, congratulations. Send me an email to rich, R-I-C-H, at musicmedic.com. I will get you your discount code. And for all those of you who are watching, we're going to be talking about Music Medic uh, closed hole flute pads. We're going to turn them into an open hole flute pad. Yes. If you want to see a sample of the pads that we make here at Music Medic, feel free to send me an email again to rich, R-I-C-H, at musicmedic.com and I can send you a sample of our flute pads to yeah, try. Absolutely. Uh, Leroy, so we're going to talk about open hole flute pads and installation. Why don't we go over the tools? I know there's several of them. Yeah. <laughs> Let's go over the tools that we're going to use today. Yeah, there, there's a number of small tools when we're doing this, so all this stuff here. Mm. So um, where should we start? Here we go. So obviously, flute itself, uh, digital caliber, leak light, um, regular butane torch, I like the I like the ES one thousand blazer that we carry. Uh, Air torch will also work in this situation. Um, rawhide mallet, uh, screwdrivers, uh, pliers. Uh, these are my go-to parallel duckbill pliers. Uh, the feeler gauge assortment. We have our um, open hole pad flute punch right here. We have some partial shims or sorry, shims that we can turn into partial shims. Um, spring hook, feeler gauge. Sharpie. Whoops. And here we go. Oh, sorry about that. That's no, it, not your fault. Regular pen. Uh, tweezers. A little poke. A little poking device. Our um, our grommet remover. Our open hole flute tool, which is has been redesigned to make everything a little bit more efficient. Uh, it's just we're going to start production on that. Uh, few weeks next month or something like that so it'll be available soon okay i'll and still then, put a i'll still put a link to it in the description yes yeah that's good thank you for the update and then uh our, our the flu pad iron as well okay and our little material snips so those are the all of the tools that the plethora we, of small tools <laughs> very good all right so what is our first step for this open hole pad process okay so very similar to last week when we went over to closed uh the closed hole pads is obviously if the pad is torn or old or worn we're gonna have we're gonna have to assess that problem first and then remove that remove that pad. so uh, obviously you can see the difference here if you just look at the top of the key so this has a hole in it that does not this is what this would be considered a closed hole pad or pad cup and this would be considered an open hole pad or pad cup so we're going to focus on the open hole one so from here I'll just get my screwdriver and remove that rod. Take the pliers and take that off. Move this out of the way. So, so this is the guy we're going to be removing. So last week we dealt with this situation right here. So it's a little, a little tiny screw that holds a washer that holds the pad into that pad cup. Here's the difference. I'll hold them side by side so you can see it. So this guy, the open hole, has basically got like a basically like a little um, a bushy, like a bushing grommet kind of thing that basically holds in there just by pressure. Um, this is screwed in. So this guy, we're not doing that anymore. This is the one we're, but this is the one we're working on. So the first thing you're going to want to do, again, to eliminate any 
any weirdnesses or any differentiations when you're putting stuff back together is to mark the grommet and basically put it into orientation to the, the pad arm right here. So what I've done, I've already done this, but basically what you would do is you would just take a screwdriver like this, line it up with the pad arm and just kind of like rake it over there and just make it, make a mark on that grommet. So that'll allow you to put the grommet in the exact same orientation when you're putting everything back together. Now, Leroy, is there a reason that you don't mark that with a pen? Yeah, good question. Um, yeah, because because you are going to be handling the grommet and you're touching the surface and stuff, depending on like the acidity of your hands and the oils in your hands, it can actually remove the the Sharpie marker. Maybe not all the way, but enough to where it would be harder to see. Okay. This way, you're putting little scratches on there. Even if you have to move, even if you have to move the key around a little bit, the light will catch it, and you'll never you'll never be. You know, I'll say you have to worry about that. I'll say rubbing off. Okay. So from here. We'll use our grommet removing tool. And then the important thing with this is you want to make sure to use the edge of the pad cup as I'll say the leverage to remove this. You don't want to use the pad itself, especially if, if you're removing this for like the second or second or third time if you're doing partial shims. Because if you push on the pad, you can damage the pad and then you have to start all over again. So more fun, right? <laughs> so from here, again, I'm just going to use the edge of the pad, the pad cup as leverage. I'm just going to Go around and then boom, there it is. It comes right up. So I'll take that off. And that's the grommet that holds that pad in. Now, Leroy, say you're taking taking that off and you make a mistake and say you damage the, the grommet beyond mm. repair or break it. Uh, is there, what do you do in that situation? Um, call the customer and say, can't fix it. <laughs> kidding, no, kidding, kidding, kidding. Um, if, if you're taking a metal grommet off like this and it cracks, uh, there is pretty much no fixing it. Okay. So at that point, you would just toss it, use it, for, keep it for memorabilia, whatever you want to do. Um, and you can either A, buy a metal replacement, or what I would normally suggest would be to kind of like upgrade at that point. Um, we sell uh, the Jim Schmidt Delrin uh, flute grommets, which are fantastic. Um, they're easy to use. They're easy to put on. They're easy to take off. Um, the only thing that you'd have to do is basically make sure that it's the right size. You would have to measure the chimney on the inside to make sure that the size that you're ordering matches the size of that key. Okay. And that's it. And then, I mean, instead of, and again, I love this tool. It works great when you're doing metal grommets, but when you're doing the Delrin ones, they're, they're cool. You can literally push them on with your thumb and remove them with your fingernails. I mean, they're super easy to use. They're okay. awesome. Very good. So from here, again, we're going to take, we're going to, take this pad out because obviously we're going to replace this thing. I have already done this, but to show you how to make sure you're actually going to either get the correct pad to put back in there, um, you can measure the, either the pad or the pad cup. If it's a good fit, measure the pad just because if it's a good fit, why not? So I've already pulled the right size, but just, just to kind of show you guys. So back that off because it's a little tight. So we're measuring 17.7, so I would probably, I usually like to go up a little bit, just because if I go down, I know it'll fit loose. So I would go up to an 18, and then to measure the thickness. Make sure it's nice and loose, that is, that is pretty loosey-goosey. We're really right at 2.7. So I pulled a 2.7 millimeter thickness pad, at an 18 millimeter diameter. Okay, so when they see that that 17.7 on the caliper, they yeah. know that they should order an 18 millimeter. Yeah, I, okay. I, I usually like to err on the side of big. Okay. Um, obviously not too big. I mean, if it's gonna read 17.5, don't order an 18, I would order 17.5. But if it's like 17.75, it's that, I'll say it's the normal, if you guys have ever taken any normal math, so I mean, if you're older than 18, I'm sure this has been a thing. You know, when you're looking at decimals or fractions, once once it passes a certain point, and you're talking about rounding rounding up and doing whole numbers, there's that fine line, and usually usually the 0.25 area right about there is about the line you want to start to go up to that next size. So if you're at a quarter millimeter higher than 0.5, it's time to go up to the next yeah, size. Yeah, and and gotcha. that one and that one said 17.70, but I mean when we're talking 
tenth of a millimeter. That's not too much. Yes. So I would, again, always try to go toward a little bit bigger when it's in that ballpark. So now, now we need to make this pad into something that looks like this. So we need All to right. put that bigger hole in there. So How do we do that? Well, magic. <laughs> so we've got this tool right here. This is our um, open hole flute punch, flute pad punch. This tool is awesome. I love this thing. I wish this would have been come out when I was behind the bench a long time ago. Um, I love this tool for mainly because the, the fit of everything is really good. But the, the other thing that I really love about this tool is that this little, this little horseshoe right here, when you put this in there and it cuts it, it stops. That horseshoe makes that stop. The cutter never goes past the edge of the tool, which means the, this cutter really only comes in contact with the pad. So the nice thing is, with that, the nice thing is the cutter on this thing will last far longer cutting just pads than going into like, like, a, like a cutting pad block thing on your bench, gotcha. which, which again are great, but any way to help save the cutting edge of something like that is awesome in my book. Okay, so how do you use that thing? So I like to have the skin side up. So I will take the proper size. And are those sizes on the on the little dies there? Are yeah, they labeled? They are labeled. You can kind of see it right there. So it's Music Medic 18. So you have the 18 millimeter die there. Yes. That the pad goes in. Yep. And there are two steps in there. So it's going to go on that lower step, skin side up. So I'll just put it in there just like that. And then I will take the cutter and the top part of the tool, put it together, put that in there. And you do have to give it a little bit of a little bit of a hit just because you're cutting through material. So I'm gonna make sure to hold this together and hold this down. This is not the most <laughs> stable surface, so work with me on that one just a little bit. So okay. Like I said, this is not the most stable surface, so it's a little bit more difficult to cut this than it normally would be. There it goes. And it does make a, a different sound when the cutter goes all the way through right. the felt. And the cool thing is, it'll always tell you. So it's, again, it's bottomed out. That means the pad is cut and you are good to go. So from here, I'll just do like a little twist action. That's what it looks like at the bottom. And from there, I'll just kind of pull the cutter out. Then I magically have an open hole pad. So I'll put that stuff off to the side. And then from here, there is a shim in the back. And because I measured the thickness of the pad, and I'm, I'll say, and I picked the pad that was the appropriate thickness, I will leave the shimming material in there just for, just to start. Okay. Whether I have to remove it or not later, I don't know. We'll find out. This is the learning thing. We're going to learn as we go. Uh, but if I do, that's fine, but if I don't, then it's cool and it's in there. So what I'll do is I'll put the pad in the pad cup. Then from here, also, you saw the line on the shim going up to the pad, going up to the pad arm. Same thing with the grommet. Same thing with like we did last week when we marked the pad. We're gonna go ahead and mark the pad. Okay. With a teeny little line. Lining up with the key arm. Lining up with the key arm, just like that. And then this guy right here, this is our open hole flute tool. And you're probably wondering, what the heck is this going to do to help me put the grommet back in? Well, here's a cool little secret of this guy. That comes apart, and then that tool pops right out of the end. This is your grommet setter right here. So then you can take the rest of this coolness, put that out to the side. So there's two parts to this grommet setter, okay? So there's this part right here, which is the base. So basically this goes through the key just like that. Okay. And then you have this top part right here, which so the Delrin pushes on the grommet under the, under the pad. All right. And this top part here, as you can see, I will show you guys. Push this in and then I'll back it way off. So as you can see, there's a lot of material showing here. So I'm just basically going to unscrew this and it will slowly 
go down. So that allows you to set the height of the ground. Correct. Okay. Because each brand, each flute, whatever, is going to have a little bit of different, different height when it comes to basically this whole thickness here. Okay. So this, so this allows you to cut, basically customize how far the grommet goes in there. And then usually, uh, usually what you'll want to do is before you remove that grommet, you're going to want to basically check it and test it before you remove it. As long as everything looks normal on there. If it looks wonky or too high or too low, then that's something you can adjust when you're putting it back together. Okay. But for normal, I'll say, for, but for normal, for normalcy's sake, it would be what it is when you take it off. Now, if say they forget to do that, and should they just check another pad? Yes. Okay. Yeah, they absolutely can do that. I mean, as long as long, if there's something there for reference, great. If there's not, there might be, I'll say, a little bit of a learning curve. But it's always good to start off high, and then go low instead of the other way around. Okay. So for here. You'll want to, we'll basically just, we want to take this grommet, line up that little scratch that I put on the grommet to that pad arm. Give it a little bit of push to get it in there, to get it started. And then we will take our grommet setter. Usually, just a little bit of push will do. Many times you'll need to give it a couple little a couple little smacks or whatever to, okay. get, to, to really set that grommet in there just to be safe. So probably like something like that should be just about good. It sounded like a tap in this room versus, a, say, a hit. Yeah, I mean, most of, most of the time it is a tap. Okay. Um, as long as, long as the, the, the fit of the grommet to the key is proper. It should, you shouldn't have to do a ton of force to put it on there. You should just need a little bit of a tap just to say, give it a little extra incentive okay. to go on there. You shouldn't have to like wail on it with either this guy or anything bigger than that. All right. So from here, again, this is a brand new pad, so there will be some wrinkles on there, just like when you put the screw on there with the washer. So you'll want to take, take that flute pad iron, just like this. Have some water. Yes, it's water. It's not anything else. Sorry, guys. <laughs> okay. Take that guy. And again, we're going to just put a little bit of water on there to wet it. So we're basically ironing right now. So I'll move this out of the way. And from here, this is where I'm going to use my torch. Like I said, if you guys want to use your air torch, totally works and it works great. It just, for this kind of thing, it doesn't work as fast. So I'm, I'm basically using the torch for a speed for speed at this point. And um, it doesn't take me very long to do this. So if I'm going to hit, I'll just place it like a couple seconds. I'll check out the inside of my arm. And the reason I'm using the inside of my arm is that this is very, I'll say, delicate. So it kind of like the, it's kind of like the back of your, the back of your knee on your legs. You know, not a lot of, not a lot of things touch that area of your skin. So it is, so it's a little more sensitive. So if it, so if you can't, if you can't touch your skin with this, it's too hot. Um, if it's, I'll say, hot or warm while you're doing this and you can stand it, then you're probably okay. But if you lift it up and like one little tap and you've branded yourself, ah, something tells me it's too hot. So again, it just takes a couple seconds. One, two, double check it. That's totally good. Just do that, iron that out. All the wrinkles are now gone. And then from there, I'll move all these cool things out of my way because I don't need them now. And then I will put the pad, I will put these keys back on the instrument and check and see where we're going to land as far as where this new pad's going to sit. So Leroy, well, Leroy, while you're doing that, uh, what happens if they burn the pad skin? So say they the, the pad iron is a little too hot and they end up burning the the skin on the pad well can't repair the horn anymore <laughs> no kidding 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 um it happens i mean i've done it more times than i'd like to admit but uh at that point you you burn the skin you see it you're you kind of just do the whole meh rip the pad out put it put a new one in yeah okay very good good tip all right so we got the keys back on key is back on there and then we'll turn on our leak light which is nice and bright love that um, so this is actually kind of a nice thing here because 
even though this key section is gone, I can show this to you. Um, this is a split E mechanism, which allows this key, the G2 key, to also to be independent. So what I've done to allow to allow me to be able to see this key, I'll say more by itself as I've backed the screw adjustment off. So if I push this down, you can kind of see that that G2 is like not even close, which is great because that allows me to isolate the G1 to see how everything's going to work with the seal on that guy. So I'm going to turn this around just so I can see this really quick. Actually, she looks pretty good. I'm not going to lie. Um, so from here, um, I will take my feeler gauge. I will hold this down again just to kind of el eliminate any, any extra stuff that might be in my way. And then I will test... Does it matter oh, that the leak light's in the instrument as you're using the feeler? It does not. Um, the the key the key about this is that there there is one um, pad pad style or brand that you have to watch the heat of the leak light while you're doing while you're doing this. Standard traditional pads, not so much. I okay. mean, I mean, I wouldn't leave a leak light in there for like hours, especially for like the ones that are closed, but. If you're doing work like this and you're kind of like putting, taking the light in and out, in and out, it's not something you need to worry about. The, the, thing, the thing to think about too is like if you're holding this thing and you're working it, working, working, and all of a sudden you start feeling the body being warm, that might be an indication of like, eh, you know what, maybe I need to take a break, take the light out. Okay. And then start back up after it cools off. But that's actually the great thing about these things. They don't get, they really don't get hot. That's a Flexi Nova uh, leak light. Yes, okay. Flexi the Flexi Nova. This is the this is all, I'll say our 2.0 cool version that we upgraded sometime earlier this year. So yeah, it's great. Okay. I love it. Uh, but I checked this thing, and we're actually pretty solid except for a little area in the front. So that is actually awesome and great news. It'll make the next step. Or next couple steps depending very easy so from here um, what I would do is with my feeler gauge go all the way around this pad find out where it stops catching and where it stops catching and then I will use the sharpie and I and I went all the way around here so I kind of have an idea of where we're at I would basically just where it stops catching I would put a line where it stops so it would be catching here, but not here. And then I would put a line here. So to kind of to kind of go over that a little bit more. So you can see the, I'm going to shut this off. There we go. So those are my two little Sharpie lines right there. Yep. I went all the way around this pad cup and this part here, basically this whole back part, seals pretty evenly all the way around. This little section up here is light. So that's where my partial shim is going to go. And this is where using this array of shim material is very, very useful. Well, what I've done in the past a lot is I've cut a little piece of each material and then made a feeler gauge out of each one of these. So, I, so literally I've, I've, in the past I've had like five feeler gauges on my bench just around doing stuff. Um, but I've done this enough where I can either see it or feel it to kind of know what, what thickness I would need. This particular one would need a two thousands. Um, another tip is if you're doing a bunch, like a, a few at a time to make sure that you know what thickness you're going after, you can put it like with like little dots on there. So you're basically almost, I hate to say like braille, but you're basically leaving yourself a road map. So the two dots means two thousands. One dot would mean one thousands. Okay, and so, and the feeler gauge material that you have here, that's part of our feeler gauge assortment. Yes. And then you have the corresponding shims made out of the same material. Correct. So you're checking with the feeler gauge and it's a certain thickness, and then you're gonna go back and use that same thickness in the shim material? Correct. 
Cool. And does it work 100% when you, like if, like if you were to use a, like a 2000, I'll say extra shim, and it's dragging nice, and you were to put a 2000 shim in there, is it going to be perfect? In reality, maybe. <laughs> in, in fantasy land, yes. I mean, and I'll say when you're just looking at numbers, yes. But in reality, sometimes things either don't work or whatever. There's There's been plenty of times I've put, it needs a 2000 shim. I put a 2000 shim in there and it looks like I've done nothing. And then it's like, what's going on? There's also times where I've done like, oh, it needs a thousand shim. And I'll put a thousandth in there. And it's like I put a boulder in there and all of a sudden nothing else is working. You just kind of like wonder what's going on. But um, it's that, and that's just kind of getting the feel of partial shimming, doing doing it and kind of knowing how to attack a certain situation. Okay. So in this situation, yep. it looks like it's uh, it's it's light in the front or it's light in the you know in the front of the pad cup that's yep. facing the camera. Yes. So what's our next step with that? So from there, I will take this off. And this is I'll say, and this is where the quote unquote fun begins. It can be partial shimming can be can be time consuming. The great thing is once you once you do it a, a few times and do this and do it here and there on different instruments over time, you get very quick at it and you get to know kind of a better idea of how to attack certain things instead of just I don't say either guessing or relying on like the others the others the other uh, feeler gauges with the different thicknesses of material. You get a better idea and a better feel. So from here we'll take this we'll take our grommet remover and just remove that grommet using the edges of the key to remove it and then see that's another reason why it's great to have that mark on the pad so we know the orientation so we'll remove that pad very gently that shim is still in there marked which is great i will get this guy right here so this is the thickness that we need we'll get our material shears like this Cut a little piece off, and the piece that's in the tweezers, that's the piece we want to, I'll say, look at using, okay? So I'll actually turn this over and measure the, and line that up to see how we are with the size. So it might be a little hard to see, but you're going to want to make sure that this shim material is inside those two lines you drew. Having it just a little bit smaller than the lines is perfect. Having it just up to the lines is okay. It, it might, it would probably still work, but having it bigger than the lines, no, it's too big. And you have to go back in and cut it. Okay. Um, so from here, um, there's two, there's two ways to put the shim in. Um, here. So we have our, um, shim and I'll say bladder skin glue here. And we also have our Ultimax high viscosity key oil for this specific for this particular time i'm going to use the key oil um, when these are these are plastic shims so this is a cool trick so you can actually use the oil and the shims and it will actually hold it in place you can use the glue too works great um, but this is a little bit easier to use for the plastic shims however if you're using paper shims you have to use the glue have to use the glue because if you use oil for paper well i mean oil and paper just kind of like disintegrates yes so i'm just going to put a little i'm just going to put a little dot on there nothing crazy now leroy i know there's some debate over the the oil inside the pad cup uh i guess if folks are unsure of that they could just use the water soluble shim and bladder glue is that right oh yeah okay yeah absolutely so the other the last thing i'm going to do is again, just basically make sure that I've lined up that shim with my lines. That's my partial shim inside the pad cup. Can you show them the outside of the pad cup too? This yeah. is hard to see in the camera. There's, there's the marks. I know it's kind of hard to see, but... And then where's the shim? Right on the other side. So okay. just line that up as best you can. Make sure that it's good. Use that orientation mark on your pad. Put the pad right back in there. Do this. Oops. 
put the grommet on there first. Line that mark up so the orientation is where it should be. And put that on there, do a couple taps. And we should be good to go. From here, we move all this stuff out of the way. And we will put this back together once again. Okay. And while you're watching that, if you are watching this live stream, whether it's uh, currently right now or if you're watching it sometime in the future, if you want to see a sample of our flute pads, our closed hole flute pads that you can make into open hole flute pads or our open hole flute pads, make sure you send me an email to rich at musicmedic.com and I can get you your pad sample. And don't forget to take pad tober. Put that in the comments below. That's going to give you a chance to win our prize for next week. Yes. All right, Leroy, so you've got the keys back on. Yep, keys are back on. So from here, and again, I'm just going to do like a little quick thing. Um, steel ceiling in the front, so it isn't like I put a boulder in there. So yay, that's a win, first of all. Hey. <laughs> and, then the, nice. and then the next thing I'll do is, I'll again, I'll take my gauge, take my feeler gauge. I'll get this out of the way, and I'll hold that down. And I'm basically just going to see how, see how we're doing with that. It is grabbing. It's better, but it's not 100% which is okay. So what I would do at this point is I would take the key back off, probably put either another two thousandths or another or a thousandths in there, put it back on and see where we're landing. Like I said, it's, it's a back and forth process. There's, no, there's never anything that's, I'll say, an absolute when it comes to partial shimmy. Okay. But yeah, it can be, like I said, a little bit, little bit of a time process, but when it's done, it is solid and it's awesome. Very good. All right. Well, Leroy, thank you so much for that excellent demonstration. You answered all my questions. We talked about the grommet being broken. I'll put a couple of links in there for the Jim yeah. Schmidt uh, Delrin bushings for the open hole punch, yep. uh, as well as the shim and bladder glue. Those are some specialty things that are uh, relatively inexpensive. Some of them very inexpensive, like the feeler gauge set, which are going to give you a, a good start on getting yes. all of um, <laughs> 100%. These types of pads are padded. Uh, we're going to be back next week with Leroy again. We're going to be uh, continuing on with Padtober, and we're going to do uh, how to install a oboe pad. We're going to do both the top joint and the bottom joint. And the bottom joint. Yes. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you take Padtober. Put that in the comments below. If you have any questions about padding, you can also put them in the comments below, and we'll be happy to answer them as we as we can. So until next time, thank you for watching, and happy repairing.